as a young female gullible adolescent you know i ended up in some toxic situations and then to show up at work the next day my my house is burning down but i can i can let you know that i'm okay Hi everyone, Paul McAuliffe here from Autism from the Inside. Today's topic is uh, high masking autistic women. So we know that one face can never be the, the, the one face of autism. So today we are joined with five women from across the globe um, discussing this topic um, of, of what it means to be high masking. So uh, let's meet our panelists to begin with. So maybe um, I'll invite you, Liz, to introduce yourself briefly. Yes, I'm from the UK. Um, I'm, I shall be 76 next month. And two weeks ago, I self-diagnosed myself. I'm a little bit nervous that you might all say, no, no, go away, you don't belong here. <laughs> but uh, everything I see about autism just ring so many bells for me yeah thanks liz um hannah yeah i'm um, i'm hannah i'm 27 i'm in tasmania in australia um i was i guess officially diagnosed at around easter um but knew for a few years before that um i am heading back to uni actually as a result of the whole process to study psychology um, and currently working on developing a kind of robust uh, autistic adults networking group in the local area. Thanks, Hannah. Um, Shannon. Hi, um, I'm Shannon. I'm 45. I'm in Ohio in the United States. Um, and I have uh, one of my close male relatives was diagnosed when we were kids but I was just gifted and very like my grandmother who was almost certainly autistic. <laughs> she didn't speak till she was five, but that was totally normal. Um, and so I have been looking at the criteria on and off my whole life, but not thinking they fit me. And then I read a book by Helen Huang this summer or spring. Uh, and she's an autistic novelist. And when I read her description of the internal experience of, of an autistic woman, I was like, oh, that's me. Uh, so um, I found out I was autistic from reading a sexy romance novel. And then I got formally <laughs> diagnosed autistic and ADHD inattentive. Uh, and I had a very difficult uh, and unusual diagnostic process. So I decided it was uh, important to do some public advocacy around uh, for the community. Thanks, Shannon. Um, Angie? Uh, yeah, hi, uh, I'm Angie. I'm 31. I'm in the US, um, also in Michigan, um, just north of you, Shannon. Um, and I'm currently doing a PhD in archaeology. Um, I'm very recently uh, diagnosed, I suppose, um, about three weeks ago, uh, I would say, is when the, the topic of autism kind of came up for me in therapy. Um, and for a long time, I just really thought I was sure I had ADHD. I was working through other mental health stuff. Um, and ADHD was finally ruled out. Um, and uh, yeah, so autism came up and at first it it really didn't like I had never it had never come up for me before I was a little confused by it um but pretty quickly after just poking around online for a bit it all kind of clicked so um I'm really new uh to autism as a label um but also at the same time you know I've been trying to figure myself out for a really long time so um I'm sort of at that point where I suddenly have a whole lot of new language um, for uh, for understanding things and talking about things that I had kind of been grappling with with like homegrown concepts for a long time. So I'm just it's really exciting to be connecting those dots um, and kind of seeing potential and hope where I hadn't seen much of it before. Thanks, Angie and Claudia. Yeah, hi. 
My name is Claudia Welt. I live in Frankfurt in Germany. And um, I self-diagnosed three weeks ago in a very specific situation environment. I'm 56, so I have an adult son. I have had different other issues in the past. I had to overcome drinking. I had to overcome depression. I have a lot of self-help group experience and all of a sudden I'm in a setting where I realize you know what there's something else there's something else and I, I let go of any expectations of what I should be acting behaving like right now and I ended up acting autistic and um, went online found a lot of information, found autism from the inside with all the good information. And um, it was, it felt really freeing and scary. It felt a lot of things at the same time. And I'm just incredibly grateful that I found a wonderful gang like these people here on this call. Thanks, Claudia. So masking, what is, what is masking and, and how does that um, link, in, link into your journey? Um, we might start with, with Liz. What's masking for you? Yes. Um, well, <laughs> I, I live in a, an elderly people's community, um, houses and bungalows, and I go to the coffee morning and it's desperately boring, but I... I, I've learned, I've never, never liked um, chit chat, um, but sometimes I can do it and sort of enjoy it, but <laughs> it's just so boring. And um, uh, and I want to talk about the fact that I've been talking to somebody in Russia <laughs> in the morning <laughs> on my phone and uh, they can't cope with it. So so I say I'm masking because they can't cope with it, not, not because I need to for me. <laughs> yeah. And that helps, but... Uh, yeah, I know. What, I mean, I'm I've not been masking as much recently, and I I see the glances. You know. Yeah. And and with your recent self diagnosis, um, what have you realised in terms of masking earlier in your life? Um, oh, lots of things. I I went to university and managed two two years. And then I couldn't anymore because I, I thought I was getting depressed. But I see it now it was burnout because I, I would work really well at music at what I was doing, studying. Um, I'd worked really hard at it. And uh, and then I'd be completely drained and be lying in bed all day. <laughs> so um, and eventually when I was 40, they diagnosed me as bipolar. And I'm rather doubting it now. But <laughs> um, I was on lithium and antipsychotics and antidepressants i'm i'm still on an antipsychotic and antidepressants now um but and i've, I've just had a, a horrible two years where i came off my pills because uh, because of covid where they were saying the nhs is cracking up and so i thought oh well i should, i'd better do without my pills now and get used to it <laughs> um and and that's when I started to think I was autistic then. I read a few books um, and I mentioned it to, I, I then told the doctor I was off my pills and they said uh, psychiatric people around and um, and I said I thought I was autistic and, <laughs> and they said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, they said, just be Liz. <laughs> and don't give yourself a label, but, um, it, you know, I must be autistic because... Who wants to be autistic? Who isn't? <laughs> sort of ordinary people don't want to be autistic. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, Hannah, what, what does masking mean for you? Um, well, I guess it's just whether consciously or unconsciously, it's suppressing uh, parts of myself that I would benefit from expressing and it's doing things that aren't natural to me and make me uncomfortable. Um, so I like wrote out like the basic ones, like 
um, you know, making eye contact and shaking hands. And I tend to become quite um, hyper verbal or hyper social um, when I'm out <laughs> um, to to kind of cover my discomfort at, at silences or not knowing what to say and, and worrying about what people are thinking. Um, engaging in, in social activities or, or forcing myself into spaces that aren't comfortable, especially sensory wise. Um, and then just kind of bearing the brunt of the breakdown behind a closed door. Um, yeah, and I guess if people please and kind of try to fly under radars to stay liked and seen as like not weird. Um, yeah, just trying to become like a society's normal. Um, but I guess for me that's come at a pretty high cost behind closed doors um, with things like constant meltdowns, uh, extreme fatigue, pretty 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 serious damage to mental uh, to mental health and personal relationships um and kind of a slide into suicidal ideation if i let it continue <laughs> as long as it does sometimes so yeah you mentioned the cost behind closed doors yeah that's heavy <laughs> what, what would you like people to know about the the cost of masking I guess that it's real, that it's not you being dramatic and it's often hidden. Um, I know that I've had a lot of struggle with kind of saying to people, I didn't feel I could say to people, oh, I'm autistic until I had that official paper. Um, and there were a lot of people I've masked around my whole life, even unconsciously, very, very young, like my parents and such, um, who the things they picked up, they would be like, oh, she's just a bit odd. Um, and then as I got more cognitively aware of what I was doing I would I would deliberately hide meltdowns and things um and so I guess the cost of that masking is that they then struggle to feel like they even have known you or that you've been lying to them about about who you are or how you are um so I think it's kind of hard for people to process that there is a really serious cost and it's um often kept quite hush hush <laughs> and that's not you just being dramatic or or kind of choosing when you do things. It's just a way of coping. Shannon, what does masking mean for you? Uh, for me, masking, I would have said I didn't think I masked that much uh, because I'm, I'm pretty weird, uh, openly pretty weird. <laughs> like, but it, and I would tell people, like, if they said they were stressed out going to the grocery store, I'd be like, just pretend everyone is a robot or a hallucination. Like, it's fine. You can just pretend I am legend is real and you're the last human and go through that. And it'll be like I had I was I, I'm weird. But um, but I was using a lot of humor to because I had learned that when I said things that I really thought that people laughed and thought I was being funny on purpose. And they were the things that I was really thinking and um, or the coping mechanisms I really used. Uh, so if I just, I wasn't very, I think, very good at, at masking when I was younger, but we moved a lot. And uh, when I was in grad school, my father died very suddenly and he was my best friend. And um, I, like autistic burnout, broke like I was laying on the couch for a year but no one outside my immediate circle of friends like no one at work noticed because I was at grad school and all I had to do I had a teaching fellowship is go and be functional for two hours a week and appear as though I was okay and for two hours a week I could do that and then I would come home and I would lay on my couch for 48 hours and people would have to come get me and and like take me to a restaurant within walking distance and bring me home and drive me places. Like I couldn't have, I, I lost most function. Um, I got lost in Ikea, like things like that. Um, and so that's, when I rebuilt from that point, I think I did it in a much more conscious masking way. And I learned that if I had a social media presence, I could be, I could say lots of really weird things and I could kind of teach people to expect weird things to come out of my mouth. And they would think I was doing it as part of my persona or to be funny. And then when we were in person, it would be okay that I said lots of really weird things and they would write it off as me just being quirky or funny. So um, Paul, you've talked about your dreadlocks. I did, I did 
uh, social media, uh, kind of the same way. And I would just friend people on Facebook so that then I could perform for them and not have to go through this. They would decide if they wanted to be friends with me. And I wouldn't have to go through that stress of trying to make friends. Um, but I also think masking is, I discovered it was very internal facing as well, because I had a lot of reasons that I had, like ways I had explained my differences to myself and the ways that I experienced the world and what was happening. Like I would say I was bad at hearing because I didn't know I had sensory processing issues and I just wasn't filtering background noise the same way other people were. So I would like tell them that, oh, no, no, like I'm hard of hearing. Like you, can you, can you speak up or write it down um, and things like that. So I had a lot of, of kind of rationalizations and excuses that I had to unpack to actually understand my own experience. Like I had denied a lot of my own experience. And it's interesting, your persona of funny, quirky, all of those things, if you were saying people wrote you off as that, that it wasn't a real part of you or, or that it was an act or, or something like that. How, how does that kind of fit into being authentic versus putting on a mask? Mm. <laughs> it was, it was like I put on a visible mask in order to hide that I was masking. <laughs> I, I, like, yeah. Yeah. So like you see this person, like you see this performance and then, um, you won't see the real performance, um, which is the gaps between, like you'll think I'm being my like quirky self when I'm being my real self, and then you won't notice that I'm hiding when I'm being normal, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's very convoluted. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. It's like you yeah. let people believe that your authentic self was a mask. Yes. And it was very effective <laughs> until it wasn't. Very effective until it wasn't. Yep, definitely. <laughs> um, Angie, what is masking for you? Yeah, um, I mean, so, okay, so a lot uh, has already been said that I really relate to. Um, I think when I think about this question, what I... <laughs> What I sorry, sorry, this is the one moment the cat comes. Um, so um, when I think about this, I think uh, I just think about how difficult it has been for me to sort of recognize masking. Um, partly because I feel like the name itself, masking, applies something implies something very simplistic, right? It implies there's this whole thing there that you're choosing then to cover up. Um, and I think for me, I, um, I started really, really, really early in life with this. I think a lot of people did. Um, I learned really quickly how to avoid outright rejection. Um, that, that work was done by before I was like seven. Right. Um, and when you start that early, it's, it's, is equally much less sort of constructing this external thing. It's, it's kind of equally turning it sort of inward, like Shannon said, um, and doing this work of kind of like undermining and dismantling, um, like any sense of myself so that I could kind of rebuild it to whatever it needed to be. Um, and yeah, yeah, there are like the explicit sort of rules, right? Like, don't talk too much. Don't, you know, make small talk, validate people's feelings, all these things, right? Um, that, but it's so much more this kind of like sort of impossibly open-ended question of like, who am I? Um, that's kind of, it has become sort of only answerable in the context of other people's sort of interests and priorities. Um um, so it's, I guess I just want to say it's something so much more complex and sort of confusing um, on the inside than the idea of just putting on a mask um, implies. Um, 
And the other thing I think about, think about a lot is that, you know, when I would read about masking, I would read all these things of like, oh, look, like copying other people, imitating their body language and all of these things. And I, I thought, I don't know that I really copy people. I think that I, I based have based a lot of my masking around sort of negative role models um, in a way to say, like, looking at people around me who I thought were really, you know, not succeeding socially and thinking, what are they doing? What, what, what am I what do I need to avoid? Um, and that was, I think, a lot of the way I have masked as well is just erasing um, more than 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 adding. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I have a lot. I, it's a lot. I mean, I went to theater school, so um, I, in some ways I kind of feel like I got a degree in masking. Um, I, there's, in, in, in retrospect, it, it, it's kind of actually scary a little bit how much I did. Um, there's like a, an acting method that I absolutely loved, um, which, which looking back on it, um, it is essentially a, uh, a method that is, is stimming. Um, it's, it was essentially like, T based on sort of repetitive body movements and sort of connecting with those and and channeling them in a way that allowed you to be present and allowed it to be subtle enough to be socially appropriate um and you know in retrospect it makes a lot of sense why I really connected with that um you know yeah so I guess I would just say it's very complicated and there's a lot more under the surface than just the idea of hiding. And you ask this question, like, who am I without the social, social influence? Because in each situation, there's a different optimum person that, that I can be in this, in this situation. So where, where do you feel like you can be most yourself? by myself <laughs> um you know i've been really lucky in life to have found really great people without too much effort on my part um so i have i've gone through you know tough periods sort of socially but i've always had like a core a few core good really good friends um who were um you know also unusual people um and I think when I'm around when I'm around uh, people who are so different, um, I feel like you know there's obviously a lot more room to relax, and I've had a lot of that, fortunately. Hmm. Okay, thank, thanks, Angie. Uh, Claudia, what what is masking for you? You know, it's it's it sounds so harmless. It's a big question. <laughs> And I have to say, I only started asking myself that question very recently. So I feel like I have hunches and I have things that connect right now. I'm not sure I'm at the end of I understand what it means to me. What I know is I a few days ago, I remembered something I've seen on TV and it was like in, in a Netflix series, Borgen, with the Danish political female prime minister. Anyhow, there is a scene, her life is falling apart. Like the kids aren't talking to her, blah, 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 blah. She's in an elevator and her life is falling apart. But out there in the hallway is the press. So like in the elevator, when she hears all this bad news, she's like just about to implode in tears. And then the elevator door opens. She makes eye contact with the journalist and says, oh, hi, and puts on that big smile for meet the world out there. And for me, that's I have a button. I can switch that on. I understand what that means. Um, and I think it's interesting that Angie just mentioned, yeah, acting, you put on an act. And then I don't know who it was. One of you said, you know, it comes with a cost. And for me, it's like, Hannah, yeah, you know, I'm beginning to ask myself, what's the price I'm paying for masking? And I know that earlier in life, it felt there is a lot of closed doors for me. You know, there is a lot of places I cannot go 
because masking takes up so much energy. And I remember I was young, I was creative, I worked in the advertising industry, and I could have made a career there, except it's not socially acceptable to show up punctually in the morning and leave in the afternoon. You've got to show up middle of the day and then work till midnight. And I couldn't do that. I, you know, a few hours of office work and I was drained and exhausted. And when my eight hours had passed, I just had to go home. So I missed the networking opportunities, hanging out with people and, you know, getting into that kind of into that tribe professionally. And I think what masking also costs me is, you know, it's one thing to say I'm able to turn on that smile. I'm OK. Knowing that I am an autistic woman and I know that today, you know, I will go for the formal diagnosis, but I'm I have no doubt. Um, There is the mask that camouflages my autistic traits. Like, I have no idea how social behavior works, but I'm going to walk into the room and pretend. And, you know, I can do that at that chit chat party level, the small talk. I can do that. Um, that's that. But then there is another level of it. You know, as a young female, gullible adolescent, um, you know, I ended up in some toxic situations. And then to show up at work the next day, come into the office and put on that extra layer of a mask, I'm okay. You know, I really know how to project my life. My, my house is burning down, but I can, I can let you know that I'm okay. Um, I think those are two things that come to mind for me right now. And um, another cost for me, a price to pay is, if I'm always projecting that, I never have intimate relationships. And by that, I mean, you know, having a person dear and close to me. And I'm very fortunate, my second marriage, my today's husband, him and I, we have that. Um, you know, but in our in our home, we are safe. And he has seen me in that meltdown in that total exhaustion. And I don't have to hide that from him. So today, I feel like I can be more intentional, I can say it's okay to switch on the big smile. I'm okay, I've got this um, for work when it's needed. But I can choose when and where and who with Maybe I don't want that always. Maybe I also want to be, be completely genuine and completely, truly share with what's really going on inside me. But then it really was a learning journey for me to, to find where, it's, it, where it actually benefits me and my relationship with people and where it doesn't. Hmm. So what can people do to make it easier for you to be yourself, assuming that's something that you'd like to do more of? I think curiosity would help. Curiosity and openness for neurodiversity. You know, if someone, ex if, if someone well, I think there is a shift in society. Be better informed. Um, you know, understand that neurotypical isn't the only way to be in this world. And do your own research. You know, every, every human member of society, every person gets into contact with neurodiverse people, like just like, you know, with all sorts of identities. So um, if people want to make it easier for me, it's come, come from a place of being not judgmental. 
and ha come with that ability to listen when I talk about how I experience the world and our interactions. So I'll, I'll throw a question open to the group at the risk of everyone saying something or not saying something all at the same time. Like we'll just have to risk that. Um, how does being a woman affect masking specifically? Oh, all the girly things that you don't want to do. All the, the shopping with, with a friend who's going, oh, this is a nice pink blouse. Oh, no, no, no. And they go, all this, I can't, can't be doing with that. I have an idea in my head and I go in and I take the first thing. But I do sometimes pretend to look at several things, but I usually go back to the first one. Well, I've got a very good friend who stood by me really well in this last couple of years that I've had a bad time with my mental health. Um, but I said to her, I was autistic and she, she just hasn't, and she's 81. Um, I think it's harder for the older people to take it on board anyway. And, and she's got no idea what autistic for women is. You know, they, they all think it's sitting, sitting and staring at a tape recorder or something. <laughs> she was my age, tape recorder. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and doing nothing. Um, they think of sort of what, what men can be like when they're very badly disabled by it. And and so I, I can't say to her, yes, I've self-diagnosed myself and, you know, uh, because she's just not going to be able to take it in. So I have to sort of respect where she is. But she's been a terrific friend. And she, she puts up with me being weird, so <laughs> I I must say I make a point of being weird quite often. So. <laughs> I have some thoughts on that. Um one so my PhD is in women, gender and sexuality studies. I my question like that I was obsessed with was like how and why do people get invested in stories, symbols, and ideas that are not in their own best interests. So I was very confused by neurotypical people. I didn't know that was what was confusing me, but I found them very, very strange. And so I, I studied them. <laughs> General to specific neural processing was kind of what I was looking at through myth and gender. And um, Gender in particular, when there's like there's studies where where um, men are evaluated based on their potential and women are evaluated based on past success. Uh, and autistic people tend to be very like we're very literal about what we've done and what we haven't done. So I mean, autistic men can be can be not by ourselves, you know, but but by others. The perception is going to be of greater competence than of autistic women because they're going like that's just the gendered assumption so even if they're saying like just this is what i do there's like gender bias in the world that makes it easier um i don't know that they experience it easier i'm just saying it's like there um systemically but um but also neurotypical people have not neuro I want to make that generalization. General to specific neural processors kind of have an idea of what a thing is, woman, and then everything that fits within that is woman, and everything that's outside of that is not woman, right? So specific to general processors, which most autistic people are, like, we're just like, yeah, everything that a woman does is something a woman does, so woman is all of that versus woman is this. So I think a lot of us have um, experiences of our bodies and our experiences and our interests that don't fit the category woman in a very narrow definition. I, a, lot of not, a lot of autistic people identify as non-binary or trans, um, but I think also that in terms of masking, a lot of masking that I have found is like 
trying to do things, not just like the shopping stuff, although Liz, I have 100% pretended to browse a store that I have no interest in. Not a bookstore, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but also like, oh, I had one. If I can remember what it, what it was, it came to mind. Like I've pretended to be interested in baby showers. I've been a maid of honor like three times. And the last time was the only time that was okay because the woman actually just asked by saying, I know you hate weddings and that you're not going to do any of the maid of honor things. I really just want you to go with me to pick out a dress. You don't have to help me. You just have to like stand there and you can pick out one dress from all of them and I will try on it no matter what it looks like. So like she bribed me basically and gave me a to-do list. <laughs> And I made her try on a green mermaid dress. <laughs> but, um, but like, it's, it's behaving in a, it's doing the things girls do sometimes also when I have no interest in them or they're uncomfortable or make my skin crawl or not speaking out about not being interested in them, just staying really quiet and on the edge of the group and just not saying what you think or contributing because if you do, then you are in some way kind of spitting on the image of someone else's womanhood because women can't contain multitudes for them. I think um, further to that point about the shopping and the kind of uh, women behaviours, I think there's a higher expectation on women to do those social niceties, the making calls and the chattering and the small talk and the I'm trying not to say anything rude to, to people who enjoy it but like to me that would be kind of inane surface level fluff that is really taxing to do and really difficult to figure out how to do um, without I find the difficulty is either not engaging enough um, especially if I don't know the person intimately and I, I just don't care um, or trying to engage and then accidentally centering yourself in that by like doing that classic um oh well yeah I know what you're thinking because I've had this experience duh, duh, duh. and it's like I'm just I'm just trying to participate I really don't want to talk to you about anything that's not like you know politics or history today thanks <laughs> um but I think there's a really high level of expectation of how women just chatter and and chatter broadly not just like vocally but that sort of social interaction that is quite heavy um, which I find quite difficult, and and even and even when I enjoy doing it with people I'm close to and I love, it's really really exhausting um, to to keep that up. Certainly, like a um, my favorite friends are my my blunt ones and the ones that can sit in my home quietly and let me do the dishes in a different room, because they understand that the quality time is just being together for me, not actually having to engage in <laughs> that's kind of expected expected talk i find also you know there are these gender expectations being blunt is not a very feminine thing feminine way to be so you get that extra rejection for being i'm just stating a fact goodness gracious and I know you should be soft and you should uh, sugarcoat it and be, don't be so cold with us. So I've had that reaction and I felt like they, and afterwards I thought, you know, in that conversation, in that situation, people wouldn't have been so offended with a man being the way I was. And I was being autistic. I was not being feminine, masculine, whatever. I was just being blunt and fact stating. And another thing that I found is, you know, women tend to have more um, commitments in unpaid work. Like you look after, you look after family members, you <clears throat> can take on those caring roles. Um, as a mother, usually in the family, in the household, it's always the woman who still carries more of the household work. Um, so there's just always constant distraction and in my story that certainly really was a factor i self-diagnosed so late 
at a place and time when all of a sudden I was in a hotel room during a work event and all of a sudden all of my normal distractions weren't there. The service, the volunteer service that I do and the family and you know none of that was there. I didn't have to cook, I didn't have to clean, I didn't, I didn't have to do any of my normal chores that fill my days. And then I realized, wow, and now I'm, 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 I'm in free fall and I'm crying and I'm stimming and I'm rocking. And it took 56 years for me to get there and notice that about myself. You know, now looking backwards, I can point at other times when, ah, oh, you were, you were revealing autism to yourself then. But there was just always too much distractions with many roles and expectations on me um to 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 just have to take up that space where what's going on i'm really conflicted about this question because on the one hand i i absolutely completely recognize like all of the standards right that are applied to how women interact with people in the world and and absolutely to all of the what i consider just girl group socializing like i don't i am terrible at it i can do it maybe for about 30 minutes um <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and, and in so that sense, I want to say, well, like as a woman, like it's like, yeah, there is this like enormous expectation to mask a whole lot all the time and be so perfect at it. And on the other hand, uh, I've pretty much successfully excused myself from like girl group socializing in the way that I have structured my life. I, I, I don't have to do it almost ever. Um, and with that kind of thing out of the way... I also feel like when I look at some of my male friends, like, I do feel like I have a lot more leeway in certain areas of expressing myself. For instance, like, I think, and I think I can get away with a lot of, like, the whole, like, the quirky thing, the quirky kind of kid vibe is not something I think my male friends on the spectrum could ever get away with. Um, you know, and, and so there are, there are ways in which I think I, le I leverage femininity to give myself more freedom. Um, and so does that, does that offset all of the expectations of like, no, when I'm on the, when I was the manager of the coffee, coffee shop, everybody thought I was a giant, like you know, bitch, um, because I noticed when things weren't clean, you know, um, it does, I don't know if it offsets that, but, but to me, that is, I do find at the same time, there are all these expectations that like, there are many more choices for me in how I present myself than I think I would feel if I, if I were to be moving through the world as a man. Yep. I think at my own frustration often, I do the same thing, leverage those sort of allowable feminine qualities. Um, and I think I, I annoy myself sometimes because things that I have trouble with, like uh, I'm, I'm very literal, so I'm always like processing the joke a little bit slower. And, you know, that thing, like if you look up gullible in the dictionary, like I'd be like, oh, yeah, where's the dictionary? Um, and, and, you know, things like that, having being re really poor memory, I'm known for, um, in, in my friend group, I just cannot remember birthdays for the life of me. Um, I've got a history degree and I still can't remember which years the world wars happened. Um, just those sorts of scattered sort of things. I definitely often play into that kind of scattered, um, scattered kind of harebrained, airbrained female stereotype because it's easier than feeling like there's a deficit. Um, in, in my capability, but then it really frustrates me because I'm like, oh, why are you coming off like this when you are sharp and you are intelligent and this isn't something they should be laughing at or I should be laughing at, but it's easier socially <laughs> to just play it off as, oh, well, you know, I'm just scattered. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's something that really feeds into a, a female stereotype that can be quite useful and, and then I worry about how, how damaging also. 
Hannah and Angie, what you were saying, I mean, you realize, like, I think when, like, there's, there are dynamics missing from our panel. There's, I, I'm not going to make assumptions about how anyone here identifies, but, um, but like code switching for um, people of color and things like that, it's really different because um, privileged women or white women, have, you know, have a, a, a different expectation and a lot more flexibility um, for how we're allowed to be in the world. Um, and like all these systems, like they're a cage for everybody, right? Like toxic masculinity is a cage for men. So then autistic men don't learn, autistic boys don't learn emotional intelligence. Generally girls are like, have it crammed down their throats. And like, this is just like kind of what the cage is for everybody. So, um, but then when you add in code switching around race or gender or other kinds of aspects of identity, an ability where your life could be in danger if you don't mask. Like, it, like there's a difference between being uncomfortable and being unsafe. So we've been talking about some of the uh, conscious ways that you're that you're aware of that this is um, can be a challenge. I'm also interested in the some of the self discovery process of realizing i thought this was me but actually i've been masking and i didn't even realize it <laughs> have you ever had that experience i um i took a test like the aq test out of online um and uh, to see if i was autistic and i realized i was answering the questions the way I thought they should be answered by a neurotypical person, <laughs> and, and, and it didn't come out <laughs> come out that way. So, um, and I, I thought, no, be really honest and go back and do it again. Yeah, and um, but when I took the the test a um, couple of weeks ago, probably three weeks by now, um, I I didn't let myself go too far, you know, to to, to I didn't let myself go for it. Um, I'm trying to say um, to come out as autistic as I possibly could. Uh, I, I was sort of careful about it. Now I thought, well, you know, do I really agree with that or just agree with it? And, and I sort of. So I think it. You know, it's fairly certain that I, I am. So I was masking to myself really. I think <laughs> before. Mm. I think that concept of masking to yourself is really interesting. Um, I think up until I hit university, I would have described myself as an extrovert. <laughs> I think I thought I was an extrovert. Um, and it was just because unconsciously when I was with people, I was doing that hyper social, hyper, um, vocal, just talking and, and being nice to everyone and, um, just, just trying to, just trying to stay really nice so that there was nothing to pull at um to, to to make fun of me for or, or things like that um and then i lived uh a little a little rurally so i didn't actually with kind of strict parents so i didn't have a great deal of demands outside of actually doing school and then when i came home from school it was like I, i'd have like a meltdown almost every night but it was just like oh she's being so emotional she's being oh it's the hormones you know <laughs> just um hyper emotional too too empathetic um, and so I just processed all that stuff as like being, I'm, I'm an extrovert. And then I kind of got to life by myself and it was like, oh, no, <laughs> no, certainly not. Um, but that was like that unconscious effect of just, yeah, it was my, it was my mask of ex, of being an extrovert socially was totally internalized because I didn't really have it challenged. Um, and the things that would have, sparked that idea of oh maybe this isn't who I am we're just washed away with t too hysterical too emotional you're a teenager whatever um so yeah that was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a shock to me when I realized I wasn't an extrovert and didn't like socializing I think the rest of my family are 
or autistic as well. Um, my first husband was was very um, opposite, for extrovert, introvert. He was very introvert, um, and he would spend. He would come home from. He was an electrician, he, and he'd been out all day doing some ladies' cooker or something, and he'd have to socialise all day. And he'd come home and have his evening meal, and then he would go in the other room, and he would be there all evening. And I would go to bed about half past nine because I got tired quickly. I know no, now know why. <laughs> and um, he wouldn't come to bed until about two o'clock. And then he'd switch the light on and read. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. <laughs> but um, you know, he was going into his cave and uh, he, he obviously needed that, really. Mm. Yeah. And my my children are my children are I think they are as well. Mm. My daughter home educates her children because she doesn't like school. <laughs> yeah, that sounds a bit autistic to me. <laughs> Not necessarily, but mm. yeah. I'm thinking about journaling. Um, the the act of journaling. I've not. I've tried at various points in my life to journal, um, and I, I I can't do it because I can't I I, I do it, but it um, even though I know no one will ever read it, and I probably won't even go back to read it most likely, um, I I can't just write freely what I would think and and part of that is writing itself but then another part of that is like I think this idea of masking to yourself like I I don't I I worried even in my own private journal like what kind of impression I'm making um <laughs> uh so that's the con context where I think that comes out really clearly um I think for me the idea of when am I masking to myself I think I'm still, I still haven't given it enough thought to even know <laughs> the answer to that. Um, I feel like I have a lot of things I'm wondering about um, and very little that I really think, yeah, yeah, that is really, you know, the truth of me. Uh, I had some... Um... I, I, I was very determined to unmask fully when I was doing my diagnostic process, so I maybe took it a little too far because uh, I was like, I am not going to use my intellect to compensate for my autism. And um, it turns out I'm really autistic, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I do a lot of compensating. Um, and so when I... So I practiced with friends trying to just like not filter myself. And I pretty quickly realized that I had no idea like what my experience was like of a lot of things. I was like, oh, no, I'm not face blind. Like I have no trouble with faces. And like I went to school with a boy for two years, moved to school, went to school, that school for several years and saw a boy wearing my old school's like jacket and I was like oh I went to that school too and he was like yeah we were there at the same time I thought like all that time he thought I was ignoring him and I just didn't realize his name didn't change like his face was the same and his name didn't change but he was in a new context so I didn't know it was the same person um and also I realized how much I was constantly like I'm really not I would tell people I'm not observant and then I monofocus um when I'm in a room, I'm just totally paying attention to the other person. And I didn't realize that what I was doing was adjusting my reaction to adjust their behavior constantly, or adjusting my behavior to adjust their reaction to me constantly, like every second. And that I was completely focused. Like I had no, I mean, part of it is processing delays, but because I wasn't aware of my own emotions or thoughts in the moment, like I would come up with those, uh, you know, an hour or two later or a week or two later. Um, 
I was, there was space. And so my whole intellect was focused on this other person's face, body language, all of it, like, so that I could read if I was wrong, if I was doing something wrong. And in large groups or spaces where, um, where I was teaching and I couldn't do that, like I had to, that, that it was a lot harder for me to mask or to come across as pleasing. Like I could perform, but I couldn't interact as well. And, and that in conflict situations, like when someone confronted me, that that ability to, like, I, I didn't think of my, I don't have a fawning personality. Like I am very like strong-willed and opinionated, but I realized that I would, my first response was placating. So, and that, and I realized a lot of that because when my, I did my diagnostic process, my therapist started, or who wasn't my therapist, it was the clinical psychologist who was doing the assessment, at one point told me I'd be dead and started crying and telling me that I was really vulnerable to predators and just, I mean, he, he lost it. He had some transference. Um, it was a, and I was completely unmasked, so I didn't, I wasn't using my intellect to compensate in the moment. I wasn't adjusting, like, when that started, and he's telling me I'm going to be, like, raped and murdered. <laughs> and I... My face went completely blank, and I just smiled and nodded for the entire rest of the session. And I just was like, it's okay. I haven't been murdered yet. I'm, you know, I'm 44. I think I'm okay. And I kept trying to make him feel better. And that was very eye-opening for me because, what? <laughs> like, like it, yeah. So, um, and my reaction had been so placating that he was not aware that he had crossed the line in the session. Cause I went to my therapist and I said, can you check on your colleague? Because I think he's having a mental breakdown. This is what happened. And he told her that like, I must've just been confused cause I'm autistic. Like he diagnosed me with level two social supports after that. And my report was filled with like all this stuff about how I couldn't see anyone else's perspective or point of view and had no care for anyone else's feelings other than my own. And just like, I had to have, it was a whole thing. It was a bad experience. But like, there is a formal process to address that. I was told that the likelihood that in that state that it would, he apologized and gave me some of my money back and corrected the report. Like I, I brought in somebody else. Like it's, it was bad. It was, it's handled. I don't want to waste any more time on it. But but I, for me, it was that moment after it happened when I was sitting on the couch and I couldn't talk. I couldn't call anyone. I had done this by Zoom. I was in the middle of a major regulatory episode. Like, I was totally freaked out. And I was texting my friends like this. He just told me I'm going to be killed. Like, why did he do that? Like, I couldn't say, I couldn't say he just had a breakdown. I was, when I was unmasked, I couldn't process it. I could just repeat what happened. So I had no ability to protect myself or defend myself <laughs> in that or deal with the situation. I just could repeat, like, like I could just repeat what had just happened, trying to communicate by repeating, like, this happened, this happened, this happened. And then other people are like, you know, obviously, is there a, this guy's crossing the line, should he be reported and things like that. And I'm like, why? I'm just still trying to figure out why I would be dead. So the unmasking, I didn't realize um, how much I compensate. <laughs> and when I did realize how much I compensate, a lot of past experiences suddenly made sense. But I also, like, learned to be much more cautious and a little bit afraid. Like, I realized that I actually cannot be trusted to be my own advocate in a conflict situation. Um, like that's when that part of my brain shuts down and I can't, so like in terms of cost, no one would have predicted that. And I wouldn't have predicted that. Even though similar things had happened before, that was the most egregious. That was the only, the first time that it happened when I actually understood, had a way of understanding what was happening in the moment. I mean, later, not in the moment, but. Um, so in terms of, I was not prepared to find out when I unmasked 
that I, I have a PhD, like I'm a vice president in a nonprofit. I wasn't prepared to find out that I lose my ability to speak and and believe everything that someone tells me. <laughs> like um, when I'm not compensating, when I'm not masking. Um, and I I think for me it was that compensating and masking had become so entwined that I didn't know how to unmask without rearranging my brain so it was like autism forward instead of intellect forward. And so I couldn't, like I lost my, my skin, not just my mask, if that makes sense. Hmm? I think, I think Angie's point was really good with the journaling and even when there is no one else around, it's still, am I happy to accept this persona? <laughs> am I happy to accept this is me or not? And if I say it out loud, then suddenly <laughs> it means something or something. So it's, yeah, really complex question. Sorry, I, I cut you off, Claudia. Yeah, no problem. I was just thinking, you know, I I've, I've, I find it difficult to answer what are the moments when I mask and I'm not conscious of it. And I was speaking with a friend today, and I think she's in the process of self-diagnosing. She will have to answer that for herself. But we both agreed that going to parties, going to the happy hour, going to certain places like Hannah has talked about, that being hyper-social, you know, what actually is my idea of fun? What do I enjoy? Does that bring me joy? And I've, I've convinced myself that, yeah, I'll go there and there are good people and that's going to be wonderful. And it's so enriching knowing all these people. And I'm just lying to myself. Um, uh, you know, if I was honest, I'd rather stay home and dig in the garden. That would bring me more joy. And that's something where, you know, going to a party and hanging out with great people and there's going to be cool music. Like I've kind of followed whatever everyone's saying is supposed to be fun. But, it, you know, if I'm honest, having f my idea of having fun is very different from that of neurotypicals. That makes me, yeah, I, I think uh, what you just said has made me think of this kind of question I have to ask myself, which is like, say, for instance, it's a party and I go to the party and I feel like it was really successful. I connected with a lot of people, all of that. And I'm happy after the party. Am I happy because I had fun or am I happy because I'm satisfied at the win of like accomplishing the party? Um. Yeah, it's almost like did I did I party right? <laughs> did yes. I, did I get the tick boxes 100%. like a Sims game or something? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I've done this very deeply, and I'm not just at a party. I mean, I I think I in college I had whole um, romantic partnerships that were actually that, you know, that I I pursued the entire thing far more from the standpoint of like I feel powerful because I can be this kind of person um and it felt really kind of good if you know momentarily um but was also not at all the kind of person I n n wanted to actually be I just wanted to prove to myself that I could um so that's yeah that's definitely something I have had to disentangle quite a lot so I'm I'm just aware of time that we are having with this fantastic conversation so we'll, we'll have to start wrapping up soon i think um and so i thought it, it might be good to um give each of us an opportunity what would you like the world to know i don't think i want the world to know <laughs> I, I don't think they can cope with it much of my world can't. Well, in mm. in that case, Liz, what do you wish the world? What what would make it easier if the world 
understood for you or allowed you to do? Well, I think I actually, people do like me, um, which makes it easier. <laughs> you know, they do, do think I'm a good person and clever and all these things. Um, it, it would be nice if they would um, let me talk about speaking to Russians and, and Ukrainians and online and teaching Ukrainians English. We, we have a lot of Ukrainians over here in Britain at the moment and they need to learn English. Unfortunately, I learned Russian five years ago and also decided to do a a course of teaching English as a foreign language, and it's now coming in very useful. I couldn't have foreseen that, but... <laughs> hmm. What do I want the world to know is having to be a closet, neurodiverse person costs both of us, not just me, but also you there in the world. I cannot bring my best to my work functions if I cannot be open and honest and transparent about this is how I operate. Um, yeah, human interaction bogs me down. That's a very unpopular thing to say. I would never, ever say that, you know, in a job interview. So my employers are really losing a lot of my capacity by not offering the kind of work environment where I could be transparent and honest with my neurodiversity. And maybe that's a goal for me to learn how to, how to communicate that in ways that people... Um, Yeah, that, that people get it at a level that they are comfortable with, not at a level that I dictate. Hannah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, sorry, I, there's some dogs in the background. <laughs> Apologies. Um, I think I'd shift to like saying to neurodiverse people, I think there's a great deal of benefit in consciously unmasking when, when it's safe to do so. Um, to kind of figure out what your actual baseline is. Um, and certainly I've found that the, there's been both, uh, uh benefits and, and then further costs of unmasking. Um, but I do think that it's a, it's a very valuable thing to do to figure out what your baseline is and then be able to go out into the world understanding where you're comfortable and what is actually beneficial for you. Cause it can be very risky to not know that. Um, but I guess don't be surprised if you lose some capabilities too. Like I really cannot look at people in the eyes anymore, which was something I took for granted prior to consciously unmasking. Um, and I think you enter like this grieving process and everything feels like the first time when you're approaching situations unmasked because it's, it does strip some capability from you. And sometimes it's harder to close that door once it's opened and go back to being, having a switch. But I but personally, the benefits far outweigh it. And I think to, to people who are, are caring for or friends with neurodivergent people, it's just about allowing safe space. Like, I mean, just think like you want safe space for yourself. Uh, of course you do. We all do. So just understand that our safe space is probably going to look different. Um, and that's not, that's not weird. Um, just, just let whatever happens, happens. Um, and be there when you're, when you're, when you're autistic, need some um, picking up and some cuddling and some comfort and, and safety. Shannon? Uh, I, well, two things. One is my current boss is amazing. And when I, I was very open with her about the whole process. And when I, like, the first thing she said to me was like, okay, well, how does this information, like, how can I use this information to support you better? Which was the ideal reaction. Um, and we talked about it. I put it in my signature line because we work with a lot of kids and that way parents know um, that I'm a, we're safe people to talk to if their kids have a diagnosis. Uh, and um, 
I just, you know, I kind of reiterated like a lot of the things we'd already kind of worked out in our working relationship. But one of them is like, I really don't get subtlety and body like, like I'm not going to get it. Like if I'm reading it or watching it in a film, I'm going to get it. But in real time, those are not the things that I'm going to pick up on. So now, like if we're in a meeting with a corporate partner and afterwards we'll be like, oh, yeah, I, I forgot. I wanted to tell you this thing happened in the meeting and this is what it meant. So so then because I can I'm capable of understanding them. I'm just not going to notice it. So things like like that's a super easy accommodation. If you notice nonverbal things happening, um, body language things happening, that like there's an unspoken communication happening in a in a situation to just like yeah. tell your autistic person that it happened because like you would you would translate if they didn't speak the language like if I, if, if everything was happening in italian like <laughs> and i don't speak italian you would tell me right mm -hmm. so like could you just tell me if something is happening and i don't know um because i'm telling you i don't i'm not going to see it like odds are very good i'm not going to see it so if you could just assume i didn't and tell me so many things will be easier. And then also, I just think as a general rule for, because I didn't know I was autistic, but I still had the same blindness like to that aspect. So when I told people, I still told people I don't get subtlety, like before I knew I was autistic, and I said, you know, like I really am not, just please, please, please be direct with me. And in situations where people were direct with me, we got on fine. And in situations where people w would not give me that accommodation, mm -hmm. like I didn't have a diagnosis, therefore I was just being difficult, um, then mm -hmm. like I've left jobs for that reason <laughs> um, and experienced burnout for that reason and had broken relationships for that reason. Like I'm not lying. I there's autism is characterized by a spiky cognitive profile. You can be really, really, really good at some things and really, really, really bad at other things. And it's not going to be predictable to anyone else. Like, and neither negates the other. Like, yeah. Angie? <laughs> oh, this is really hard. Um... I mean, I guess I, I don't necessarily have a lot of thoughts in terms of sort of employment or, you know, academics or things like that. But socially, I think um, I'd like people to know that I'm not arrogant. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd like people to know that, like, it, it, I'm not trying to intimidate anyone by, you know, being smart or something like that. Um and that as well as I can explain certain things, like there are a lot of stupid questions that I'm not asking um, that, you know, that I uh, that I would love to know the answers to. Um, y yeah, I, I, I and I I guess that's that <laughs> that would that would be the thing. And that's more kind of socially, you know. I'm really curious about a lot of things that I just don't know how to ask about. <laughs> well, we might have to leave it there, unfortunately. Um, thanks so much for all of your contributions. This has been a really interesting discussion and hopefully those watching as well can, can resonate to some of the things that, that we've shared um, today. So this is obviously a, a huge topic. I feel like this is actually fantastic. We've, we've covered masking very well without talking very much at all about unmasking. So maybe unmasking can be an entirely new, uh, topic to, to look into. Um, but yeah, so yeah, uh, thanks again. Um, we'll, we'll finish up the recording now and, um, yeah, for everyone watching, I hope you found this, uh, really, really valuable.